Hey guys, welcome to episode 12, I believe, of Weekly Shonen Rundown on September 7th, 2012. This is going to be a long one, because a lot of unexpected, uh, heck, I mean, we got two fairy tale today, we got two Takamagawa, we got two Assassin Classroom. But let's start with One Piece, just because we still haven't gotten an actual physical scan that I, or digital scan that I can just keep on my computer, which I usually do, like I'm doing with virtually everything else. One Piece Chapter 680, Marine Base Captain of G5, Kichiku Virgo, which Kichiku, from what I can tell, is probably meant to be brute, which we'll see. Ugh. This chapter, a little scary. Just a little, just a tiny, tiny bit. Anyway, manga stream will usually have some other stuff, so I'll have to quickly go through that. I don't mind the colored pages. They're pretty cool, actually, because it's a sign of really good artistry. Anyway, yeah, Virgo... Not Virgo, Black... I'm too fixated on Virgo. Black Beard... Not Black Beard, damn it. We haven't seen him in forever. Brown Beard is uh, running, and everyone else is freaking riding on him, and there's a few pages of him just like, Why are you guys doing this? Get the hell off me. You, are you guys idiots? Come on. <sighs> yeah, they're like taking off their coats, and hanging them on black, black. Ugh, it's brown beard. You don't really hear about brown beard enough, is the problem, I think. Yeah. Anyway, after all that, we kind of establish uh, Toshigi and G5 are a little behind them, and apparently, I think they'll later establish Luffy and uh, Smoker are already in. Block B. Anyway, the other G5 members are trying to tell us to Shiki we have to leave the island and contact Marine Headquarters. Because, you know, bad stuff's happening. But, oh no! A dragon comes down and breathes friggin' fire. And then, yeah, apparently, uh, Vegapunk uh, made them artificially. And it apparently is do it dodges their bullets and then bites into the freaking wall after someone manages to dodge. And it bites into solid metal. So this thing is really dangerous. Yeah, it bites into solid metal and just uh, crunches it. And it has a really scary look on its face. It's very uh, snake looking. Ugh. Very reptilian. But then the dragon notices something and flies away because apparently... Uh... Oh, it's probably because it actually senses Virgo. That's what happens. Because that's what happens eventually. The other G5 think that reinforcements have come, and it's Virgo. And he's just kind of standing there, and they're like, yeah, you're awesome, dude. How much uh, reinforcements have we got? You already tell Vice, I already tell headquarters he's a vice admiral, which means he's uh, right under Kizaru and... Uh, well, what Aka Inu and uh, Aokiji were. And Dashigi is actually realizing Virgo is very dangerous. She tells him to run. It's too late. He's already beating him up. It looks like he's actually giving them the finger. But I think he's supposed to be using his index fingers. That's how Shigan works. And, like They're like, what the hell? Ah, the pain. Yeah. And the fact that he's, it's revealed he's using Shigan makes me think he's probably an expert in the other Rokushiki abilities, which we learned about in uh, Aeneas Lobby. And then we have a flashback with Toshigi and Smoker meeting him, and he is being kind of nice, but at the same time, apparently she... Well, I mean, a lot of the flashbacks are him just acting very nice, and then now he's just being a complete brute, as his nickname apparently is. One of the G5 members even says he has a sick sister, and, you know, all this, that he's taking responsibility for the G5 being destructive as usual. And then Toshigi asking about that uh, child kidnapping, he's like, no, that was just another mistaken report. And he's trying to be, he seems very compassionate. To, and he says, you'll understand one day when you too become a parent, which makes me think he might have children, who knows. But then again, he could be lying. Toshigi tries to attack him. And he blocks it with his freaking arm, so, I mean, I'm trying to remember that. I think that is actually a Rokushiki technique where you can harden your skin like that, or it might just be hockey, actually, where you can 
literal you can literally harden your skin to like iron either way boom he beats her up he just knocks her away and then these other guys are thinking that it's a fake but yeah, Virgo just beats him up again with almost not even moving from the spot he is that powerful but then and then it looks like someone else is attacking Virgo and we can't tell who it is it could be Robin no no it's no, never mind you think so and then yeah it says a lady is and you think my Virgo might be saying it but no it's Sanji boom beats Virgo in the face with his foot and it's because he heard Tashiki crying which yeah Anyway, that's establishing that uh, battle, which is very nice, actually. And then uh, they, other uh, Brownbeard's group sees the uh, dragon, but then again, apparently uh, Brownbeard says it's a small one. It's an evolved version that was made at a later stage. It was actually not the one under the sedative and all that. Anyway, uh, Luffy and Smoker are almost to uh, Caesar's lab, apparently. They're, they've they already gotten across most of the B area. But Caesar is very pissed off and that Virgo is killing the G5 because he was going to use them as experiments. So he tells uh, them Monet to block the G5's forward route, which means cutting off uh, the passage into B on the other side. And then blow up the barrier from behind. I'm scared. Damn it. And then, yeah, Monet brings up that isn't Virgo with him. And C uh, Caesar Cloud does not care. Anyway, Luffy and Smoker are at the door, and apparently, yeah, Smoker can actually just fly, but Luffy had to run there, so he's telling Smoker to wait, but then it doesn't matter. But they already, and they, as they open the door, they already established that Virgo's going to be Smoker's opponent, and Caesar's going to be Luffy's. And then Smoker's a little disappointed when it turns out only, uh, uh, Caesar's there, and the last page has Luffy smashing Caesar in the gut with a punch. I'm wondering, I wonder if he says, he says Shugo Caesar. I don't know what exactly he means by that. But, yeah, that's going to be for next week. Let's go to... Mm, let's get some of these out of the way. How about Takamagahara 7? We get like two of these at once. So, uh, Yamato versus Jin. Yeah, last time, our big blood sucking Hulk, as it were, uh, was powering up. Yamato's talking to a Kikuchi, figuratively speaking, so, and he says the only way he's going to figure out about his divine gift is to fight. So he punches him, sends him flying. And then, uh, unfortunately, Jin is right near the blood bank, so... Uh, apparently, his, I, I didn't notice this, um, but Mizuho observes it to the uh, audience that his outfit, his uniform, changes into a Gakudan, which is uh, not apparently what he usually uh, wears, and his hair is spiked up. But he tells Mizuho to stay back, and oh no... Yeah, as I say, he was near the blood bank, so we see him. We see Jin draining all his blood, and then Arr! he's hulking out. And as Mizuho says he's a monster, he's just saying, "You're, I'm a Superman. I'm not a monster. I'm beautiful." And he's just gonna. He basically threatens to suck her blood because. I don't know. He's he's going crazy. Basically, is the idea the honor of having his, her blood sucked and living on within him. Anyway, and it looks like, well, I'm guessing, yeah, what, um, Yamato punches the alarm, I'm guessing, so that someone can stop Jin, I don't, I'm guessing. Anyway, and then we see Jin has gotten even bigger, apparently, because I mean, before he was probably already like seven feet tall, and now he's just, he's barely able to fit into the hallway, he's so huge. Or maybe it might just be a bit of an exaggeration, anyway. One of the nurses uh, hears the alarm and sees Jin and she thinks it's like a bear or a gorilla. Anyway, he's attacking and he uses a bullet hole punch and it, you know, big as a bullet hole from a magnum, according to Yamato. So, And then Yamato tries to punch him and it feels like punching a freaking water pillow, so it's not, it's not going to work very easily. 
He tries to use his power like he used on uh, the last guy, whose name, honestly, we're not supposed to probably expect to remember. But it doesn't really work. And then he just keeps punching at him. And he has a flashback uh, to him talking with his brother. And uh, his brother tells him that there are two ways you can beat a monster. Either you put him in a chokehold and stop the blood from flowing into his brain, or you can knock him out with a hard enough punch to the head. So Yamato thinks he couldn't clear the flow of blood because, well, that's part of his power, so he has to be able to actually get high enough to punch him in the head. Uh, then Jin attacks him, and he manages to, he has to take the attack because the music is right behind him. He manages to block it pretty well. And then as Mizo is crying, and he's like, ha ha, I'm gonna drink the woman's blood or I beat you up. But Yamato doesn't like when uh, Mizuho's childhood friend cries, and we see like these black flames coming off of him, so... Ugh. But then he moves forward at pretty high speed, or at least by comparison. Jumps up his knee, and then boom! Slams an uppercut right into his jaw, and then knocks him into the ceiling. And he's pretty much won. And Mizuho is... Uh, Apparently talking about uh, talking to Yamato about a flashback when he uh, saved her from a giant dog, which so apparently even back then Yamato was kind of strong, but he's apparently sleeping. So, but let's just get to the next chapter because we have that. Luckily, I didn't actually think we would get two chapters. Come on, ah, ah here we go. It's a bit. Uh, Takamagahara chapter eight. Now this is actually a pretty cool chapter, I'd say. Because it really tries to establish uh, some more characters, and also we change setting to a very important one, I'd say. Uh, Kikuchi is talking about if a person's treated as an idiot, the depths of one's heart are filled with rage. If you're treated kindly, you'll save someone. Um, and he's talking basically about Yamato being treated as both an idiot and a person who's treated kindly in a sense, because Kikuchi is treating him like an idiot, but Mizo and others are treating him kindly, and that's, yeah, he's risking his life to save others, as Kikuchi says, sort of thing. And he asks these two guys, Kumaso and Izumo, if he's willing, he's uh, worthy of living in the age of myth. Kumaso, black-haired character, wearing an awesome little uh, Gakudan, he's not actually... Well, it's like a Gakudan. And it's like a sword. Izumo has this weird squirrel-looking thing with him. But, you know... And Kumaso is thinking that he's kind of pathetic. Izumo is thinking he's kind of cool. Interesting. Anyway, they go... There's a... A crow. I'm guessing that's supposed to be a symbol of Yatagarasu. Appears at a Tori. And we see... Uh, Yamato training and trying to figure out his ability. And he's thinking maybe his divine gift allows him to store up power, but it's we're probably not going to figure it out for some time still because of his being pretty important. He asks Kikuchi as he sneaks up behind him, and he's like, "No, I, I can't tell you that. You have to figure it out for yourself." He even calls him an idiot a few times. And he asks why Kikuchi called him out here, and he called him out here because he could take so he could take him to Takamagahara. And he explains that's where people from all over the world who have woken to the divine gifts can gather. But Yamato says, No, I ain't going there. But then it turns out uh Kikuchi had a words embedded a word spell into those clothes that he gave him that'll restrain him if he chooses to disobey him, puts these freaking like belts that restrain him. Ugh. And it gets worse if he gets rebellious, that'll get tighter. And then he explains about the coming of the Age of Myth, which is like back in the day when those we call gods had awakened to the power resting within and ruled the world, so, yeah. And, yeah, basically saying that, you know, the Age of Myth is coming again. There's all these people are awakening to their divine gifts, and things are going to get really powerful. No doubt. It looks like, uh... Kikuchi absorbs Jin as well, because we see him and I think it's Shota was one of his either his surname or his uh, first name. We see the two books that uh, Kikuchi makes as usual. We didn't see him turn Jin into a book, but that's expected to be what happens when they fail. 
So, yeah. He explains, in Takamakari will be able to witness both those who are swallowed by their fate and restrained and the growth of those who have awoken to their divine gifts. So, yeah. Basically, uh, Takamakari is when, where he's probably going to start training some more, is the idea. They, uh, he enters through a tori, which has this black kind of uh, portal appearing within it. And then they appear in this area with a whole bunch of tori. And those tori are connected to every part in Japan. It's kind of a nice sim symbolism because tori are supposed to be where you kind of transition from the normal everyday world to the sacred area of the shrine. And then we see Kumaso and Izumo. And apparently Kumaso's sword talks. And apparently they're new students, but... I mean, they, they seem like they are already pretty cool. And practicing their abilities. But then we... And then we see Takamai Hara appear, almost appear... I mean, it was there the whole time, but it's just so huge, you probably didn't even realize it. It's this giant conglomeration of school buildings that... It was what we saw probably in Chapter 2 or 3, if I'm not mistaken. Probably before we met Shota. But yeah, now we see it in more detail. It's has the... I think those are supposed to be the Shishi, the Guardians, and then it has the Shimanawa rope around the middle. It's like a giant pyramid, almost. Yeah. So, how about Assassin Class 8? So I feel like I covered this one, but I don't think I... I'm not sure if I did. I did, actually, I'm pretty sure. Because he, uh... Yeah. About, uh, Irina Sensei, so... Eh, I can actually, I should quickly check. Have the document here. I usually keep a pretty good, uh, what's the word, a record of what I, what series, like, what chapters I cover every week. Hmm. It's weird. Eh. Apparently I didn't, I don't know. The last thing we saw was with um, them actually hiring a professional assassin. So let's reveal her name and everything. I feel like we've already covered this, though. Yeah, we're they were talking about the students who frequently act as support in assassinations. The top of my is already May. I have 11 months now until he blows up the earth. Uh, Koto Sensei is at a convenience store and he's talking about the quality of Japan's cheap sweets is incredible. And we see he sees a girl being harassed by these dudes. And uh, yeah, she's saying, No, I have to get to the school. We should be working. These guys are hitting on her, but then he shoves them into the car and wraps it in ribbon. Maybe I'm just trying to maybe I'm remembering when I was reading it the first time. Because I do kind of occasionally will read it out loud. Yeah, I guess. So, yeah, she's uh, very thankful to him and is wearing a fairly cleavage-revealing outfit. And asks him where uh, Kuni Gigaoka Junior High School is. So she's their part-time uh, foreign language teacher, teaching uh, English probably is the idea. And her name is Irina Yelavik. All the students are, like, kind of just talking, yeah, like, why is she clinging to him like that? She's got really nice boobs, she's a babe, da 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 da, -da. I guess it's apparently Nagisa, the character, is supposed to be a guy. I always got the feeling it was a girl, but that's androgyny in Japan for you, I guess. Because I think we actually figure it out in Chapter 9 that explicitly Nagisa is supposed to be a male. And, yeah, even Nagisa is saying that, uh, Yeah, one of his weaknesses is apparently boobs, because he's at a loss, in a sense, because he's being fawned over by this human woman, and she has very nice breasts and all. This is like his fifth weakness, according to Nagisa. And Irina is kind of saying how she's captivated by all his uh, features. And even the students are figuring out that she's probably not just a regular teacher. 
then Arena's talking that, you know, she had a variety of ways to get closer, but just she didn't think that just turning on the charm would do it. And then Kurosama is talking, yeah, she's, uh, she has, she's really good. She has strong conversational skills in ten languages. You know, she can really get into, uh, uh, a target's, uh, inner circle. And she always kills her target at point-blank range. So, yeah. And Cosmo says, yeah, you'll, you'll be a teacher to keep up appearances. And she's like, no, nah, I'll figure this I'll finish this out pretty quickly. And Rina asks him about, she says, like, yeah, you're really fast, right? So, yeah, I just want to like to try, try drinking genuine Vietnamese coffee. And he's just, yeah, rockets off. Meanwhile, one of the students calls her Arena Sensei, and she's like, "Yeah, you can just do whatever you want, even though class was supposed to be starting." But she's like, "No, don't be so familiar and call me by my first name. I'll play the part of a teacher when I'm in front of that octopus. Call her Yelavik Onesama." <laughs> and then uh, Karma makes a nice joke because her uh, the Japanese part of her the Japanese uh, how would you call it the transliteration of her name. Uh, can actually be cut off with the yellow part and it would just sound like bitch. Bitch ne san. <laughs> it's really funny, actually. And Karma's just taunting her as usual. And she says there's a difference between how uh, adults and brats do things. And then, yeah, like I said, uh, well, yeah. Uh, Irina. Kisses Nagisa really, really, apparently, awesomely. And is just going to get the information out of him. And then she just says, yeah, everyone else who has useful information, come and speak with me. And she says she'll even give some manpower to the girls. With her, uh, those apparently are the three guys that were hitting on her before. They were just doing it as an act. And one of them gives her, I think that's supposed to be her Derringer, because this is not a mini revolver. And Nagisa is just saying, yes, yeah, she's very amazing. But they also really don't like her. And they even bring up the whole uh, Yelavik Bichi thing uh, next time. Let's see, what have I already covered? Takamagahara. Probably want to get to Fairy Tale after this because it's another one that has two chapters to it. Assassin Classroom Chapter 9, Adult Time. I forget what the last one was. I really should have kept up with that. But regardless, we established what it was, what was happening last time. And it was Chapter 8. And we see Irina talking to herself that, you know, she's prepared everything. Yeah. I mean, she refers to Nagisa as a, a boy in this chapter, so it's, yeah. And the geese is explaining, yeah, he has extra tentacles. Uh, even if you destroy it, he has extras. And if you're, all the tentacles aren't destroyed at the same time, he'll flee before the finishing blow. And he has a really good sense of smell. He doesn't seem to have a nose, but yeah, I mean, she's, and she smokes, so yeah, that would give her away pretty quickly. And she's just kind of confirming what we are all reminding us that she's a Rina Yelavi, she's a pro, who's carried out assassinations, da 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 da. And they do the whole bitch thing again. And she just says, yeah, the actual pronunciation is different because the Japanese don't actually have a distinction between B and V because of the. Even, yeah, in the kana. That's how it works. The bichi can be vichi and, well, bitch, of course. <laughs> and she tells me, yeah, she's trying to teach them the right way by writing down lightly on your lower lip, like that. And then just tells him to spend the next hour like that. And Karasuma brings out, brings up her uh, three-man group again. She's like, yeah, they're, her, uh, they're kind of her subordinates, as it were. And they've already completed preparation, so they'll do it today. Kodosensei comes back and he brought a uh, chai from India. And uh, says, asks him to, Irina asks him to come to the storage shed at five. They're going over there as the students are doing target practice or something. 
the students are emphasizing they really don't like her and Cosmo's like well it's the government is was uh, instructing us to keep her and trust her with this matter since she's a professional and everything and he's noting yeah she must be a top class hit man you can get this emphasis that she has like a spider web behind her it's very cool Meanwhile, Adina Sensei, I don't know why I'm calling her that. Might as well call her Bitch Nason. She's emphasizing in an infiltration, you have to be flexible. So she has to kill him in one go. And she's being very flirtatious and coming on to him, basically. And she says it's fine to be forceful because she wants to fix this tension on him. And apparently, he's getting fairly flustered by her coming on to him and all. They uh, remodel the storage shed so that these guys with all their high powered weapons. She says she's going to get undressed, so she goes behind one of them, and then these guys are firing off all these rounds. But then in, she reveals later they're not actually the anti sensei bolts. Like, if they had been, they probably would have killed them pretty easily because, I mean, they're firing. Uh, 470 round shots at 360 every minute. Three people, that's. Yeah, and it's, they're having it at different angles, so they're just covering the entire room in bullets. Where everything besides where the barriers are. But Arena thought there was no need for those anti sensei bullets. Yeah. But it turns out, well, yes, he did. He survived it pretty well. He was just had the guns shooting into himself. And then reveals, uh, lead bullets don't work against him. They all end up dissolving. Which makes sense. Heck, he can take he can drink Aqua Regia, so I'm pretty sure lead bullets aren't going to do anything to him. And then he emphasizes he actually does have nostrils. And he noted there was a metallic smell in the storage shed, and the body odor of middle aged men. So already he was figuring out something was off. And then he does his maintenance and improvement. Da 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 da. And compliments his students, saying they're much better at it. And we're not sure exactly all that he does, but we know he dresses Arena in an old-fashioned uniform and gives him, gives him, gotten a massage and all that sort of stuff. She says, "Yeah, do such a thing." I don't know what sort of thing he was talking about. He says adults have their own sort of maintenance, so he might have just done something perverted. But Arena is not. Uh, Letting that sit down, she is really wanting them. She's gonna get back at him for that. So let's go to how about well, we still got. Now yeah, let's do fairy tale, two ninety seven. This is actually relatively short. What is this chapter's name? The face of the girl I saw back then. You know, Rolo T of Weekly Manga Recap brought up this. this is basically just a fan service page of Ayrza's butt. I mean, I don't, the reason why her butt cheeks, to be fairly blunt about it, are probably mis seemingly misshapen is because I think she's actually turning her hips, so we're actually seeing more of one butt talk than the other. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Natsu won. Everyone's cheering. Yay! Day four of the Grand Magic Games is over. They'll take a one-day break, and then the last day will be a survival match in which every member of the guilds will participate. Everyone is very impressed, and they were originally targeting Sab targeting Sabretooth, and now they're going to be targeting Fairy Tail. And everyone is wanting to fight. I mean, Leon wants to fight Gray. Uh, what was it a? Uh, I forget his name. Jura wants to fight Loxus. Uh, Kagodo wants to fight Erza. For some reason, Ren wants to fight Kajil, even though we've never really established any rivalry. And kind of the same with Ichiya and Natsu. Ichiya wants to fight Natsu, apparently. And then, uh, I, forget, I forget your name, the guy with the mask and the fancy feathered hat. He's already memorized it, so that means uh, that they're in that much more danger. And uh, Genma is very, very pissed off, scares everyone away. And not to say, I mean, you don't cry about this one point. You did a really good fight. Meanwhile, Gajil is recovered from Natsu, uh, pushing him down a mine shaft and everything. He finds what appears to be a dragon graveyard. There's like at least 
four or five dragon corpses. If not a lot more. If you see all these rib cages, there's a lot of dragons there. Meanwhile, Jalal is chasing that person who has magic legs or ifs. And we see Yukino in... I'm not sure if she's in the Rune Knights. She's in some area, and she has an official kind of a temporary rank, apparently. And since she's involved in the Eclipse plan. And we figure out the name of the guy behind it, Arcadius. And he's apparently kind of clumsy. Uh, Charlotte has another flashback about the freaking, the what was it, the, the castle in the, the center of the town, the city collapsing. Anyway, yeah, Lucy's told that they won, and they don't know where Gajil is. And then we have uh, some more flashbacks of sorts, or possibly flash-forwards, because technically this is someone talking from the future. The last day was an amazingly fierce battle. And then July 7th, they lost to fate. Like, a whole bunch of people died. At least five people here. Because, I mean, we have one dot, 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 died. Something died as well. Dot, also, dot, and dot. So, actually, probably as many as six people died in that uh, fight against Zeref. I'm guessing that's what's going to happen. And that's the weird thing, because Levy is saying, yeah, someone helped. So, it's like she's writing a letter into the past or something. Jalal stops the person. Apparently it's a woman, turns around, and he's like, oh, how? To be continued. Which is in 298, which we just got uh, this morning, probably. Like four in the morning or something. Fairy tale 298. Throb Throb Ryuzetsuland. I'm trying to remember what the Throb Throb is supposed to be a, the onomatopoeia for it, which I don't think it's Doki Doki. It might be. We get some little chibified versions of the events from the 30th of June. Wait a minute. January, February, March, April, May, June. Yeah, from June 30th to the 6th of, or the 7th of July, which we don't really know what happens, but we get an indication that it's probably Zeref. Anyway, the third night, da da da, they're talking about a pool. The most well known summer rage spot, Ryuzetsu Land, which can mean either extinct dragon land or extreme dragon land. So everyone decides, let's go. Alright, Master took Luxus somewhere, which I'll spoil it for you. He just apparently took, well, we don't know where he took him, but eventually he and, uh, he, Makarov, Luxus, and, uh, Mavis all appear at the pool. And apparently also that person that Jalal met was still walking around. So this might... I'm wondering if this is actually before Jalal meets that person. Either way, more swimsuit fan service. Yay. Pfft. Yeesh. Natsu, there's a joke. Natsu rides a train and, of course, starts getting sick because that's what happens with Dragon Slayer magic. The cats, the exceeds, they uh, go to an aquarium. Apparently, Kana is just wearing her underwear they even bring up, you always look like you're in a swimsuit. <laughs> Lasana and Mira are talking about Elfman can't come and can't make it, but then he is. He and Evergreen are hiding because they don't want everyone to know they're basically dating. <sighs> and Juvia is asking Gray to ride the love, love slide or slider or whatever you want to call it. But then Leon decides to try to take her. And we have other guilds here like uh, Lamia Scale with a. Uh, Sheb, Chelia, and her group. And then, oh, well, never mind. Uh, Quattro Cerberus is here. Uh, Jenny, being a little bitch, uh, rips off Mira's top as in revenge because of that battle they had. Yeah, but then Mira rips off uh, Jenny's bottom, so pfft, just terrible nosebleed fan service. The, uh, they're called the tr uh, Trimenace from uh, Blue Pegasus and Ishia are all kind of bugging Arizona and Lucy. Apparently, I guess, I don't remember if one of them got injured in the last few days. I think he did. It's been a while. <laughs> like I said, yeah, Mavis, Luxus, and uh, Makarov are at the pool with, um, at the pool with everyone. And Jalal is here as well. Then uh, the Exceed are, and 
Apparently, Gajil and uh, Levy came with him as well. And it's really funny looking. And then we always have some panels of everyone doing various things. But then we see uh, Corona from uh, Raventail here. And, yeah, everyone would have thought they would have been captured by the army. They technically broke the rules. They didn't break the law. So they were just interrogated and then let her loose. And Corona apparently wanted to apologize, so... Maybe she's not so bad of a person, but we don't know. Anyway, Natsu and Ichi are being stupid little kids and running at the pool. You don't do that. They slip. Natsu goes flying. Ichi is spinning down the floor. Almost hits Erza and Jalal. Jalal manages to save them, but is groping Erza in the process. <laughs> and apologizes. And they have more sexual tension. Juvia is asking Gray about the love love slider again. Natsu is flying, knocks Leon and Gray into the slide, and, <laughs> and Juvia thinks it's like boy love. And then they freeze the water and start freezing virtually everything. And they're like, no, you're freezing the pool over. And then Natsu uses one of his attacks and basically makes a freaking huge explosion. And, well, now they have to, now they repair Bill. The repair bill for the pool was addressed to them. Next chapter is 299, A Solitary Journey, which is going to be... Huh. It says... Uh, translation here from Manga Stream says... It's going to be a side story, so we're not actually going to get to the Man Grand Magic Games next week. The uh, big... Uh, All-out brawl. It's a He calls it sort of an experiment. Because this, this was a side story itself. Anyway, let's get to KGB 168. It's been at least a week since we've done a lot of these series. And yeah, we got a whole bunch of them as it is. So yeah, they're, they've been walking, the group's been walking for four days to the uh, last building. Kurusu sensei is being checked by the doctor. He says, eh, it's pretty good. You might have a bit of a fever and it, it doesn't hurt anywhere. But yeah, it's pretty good, but don't overdo it. And Cruz uh, says that it's going to leave a scar, and he's like, no, plastic surgery is going to be really good. But then Yodai brings up, I don't care about a scar, and then uh, it's just really trying to establish the whole shipping between them. It might, or it potentially could be canon, which is really creepy, because Yodai might be much bigger than Cruz Sensei, but he's only like maybe 16 years old, tops, and she's at least in her 20s. But so it's already statutory rape, probably even by Japanese standards, quite possibly. Anyway. So everyone just starts going again. And uh, Rion asks, uh, "We really need to go with everyone. We couldn't. We couldn't have left half people at the pyramid." They said it's better as a group, and we don't need everyone to investigate the building. But we have something in mind uh, for the other half to build a boat. But boat for eighty people would be impossible, so we need to build a few boats. So they're gonna just do it while they're half of the other group is doing something else. And then. He's thinking to himself that it's still odd about Nishikiori's info about the stars and that they're probably actually closer to Guam than they are to Japan, or Okinawa for that matter. He's strangely obedient, according to Akira, so, yeah. And he tells Nuba to don't take, not take your eyes off the fa uh, well, it's not the fake mean, it's the real mean, the one with amnesia. And she says, he says she's the one that's going to turn the tables, and she has the key to it, apparently. So they're almost there. They're just pushing forward just a little bit more. Some ins inspirational stuff that you know they made it so far because everyone was helping each other. And then we have a whole page with everyone just f uh, reminiscing with panels that the Japanese couldn't be translated because it's too damn tiny. You'd have to be a huge fan of the series to actually remember every damn panel. And then we have just one more panel before we start getting dialogue in from Yuki. And yeah, the reason why they're, this island isn't on any maps, the reason why extinct animals are created, the reason why no one's here, and what they got dragged into, they might find the answer to it. Now, Suzuki seems thought he fell into a bottomless swamp, but it turns out it's just a river with some kind of growth on it. Some, you know, some grass and stuff just growing out of it. Mario brings up that there's a river beside the uh, last building, so they're probably pretty close. They see the building... It's not, it's only about four floors high or so, but it looks like it could be like 
it could hold a lot of people. Yeah. It's not really a tower, it's just a building. There's a wall around the tower. They see a gate. And then they step on what a, turns out to be a human skeletons everywhere. Like bones scattered all over the place. Skulls, spinal cords, rib cages. Ugh. Very twisted. A silent warning from the bones. The truth waiting for them isn't necessarily hope. Continued in issue 41. Which I'm guessing might have already come out, actually. How much time have we been doing this for? Already 40 minutes. I knew this was going to be a fairly long one. Uh, let's do Naruto chapter 600. This one is kind of just more rem uh, reminders to older fans or people who, I mean, because apparently at least either Y Ruler of Time or Roll T or both of them didn't even, hasn't even read really up to or hasn't even familiarized themselves with a lot of the older stuff. Which is a little disappointing, because honestly, I don't know why you wouldn't read the Gaiden. Because supposedly Naruto was really still good, according to them, at that point. It only supposedly got bad after the time skip. And Gaiden is not the time skip. It's a transitionary sort of chapter. Anyway, yeah. Why until now? Chapter 600 of Naruto. Which is usually always a fairly important chapter by in terms of serialization. And we actually get fair confirmation that uh, that's Obito because his uh, Sharingan, his master Sharingan, is the same pattern as Kakashi's. And Obito says, if you want to call me by that name, go ahead. It doesn't have any meaning to me. But then we're reminded, yeah, Kakashi got his eye damaged. Uh, Obito saved them. Kakashi's even remembering. Yeah, I mean, Obito saved him from being crushed by a boulder because the little uh, when a rock hit him in the blind spot in his left eye. And then he was he fell over. Obito pushed him out of the way and got crushed by the boulder. And then, yeah, he, he was the only one that didn't give him a present for becoming a Jonin, so he gives him his Sharingan as a show of friendship, and then just take care of Rin. And they leave, and he gets crushed. And yeah, Kakashi's amazed. You survived. And then Naruto doesn't know who he is. Kakashi explains. And they ask, if you're alive, why up until now, whether or not I survive is irrelevant. Because he's talking about, yeah, I mean, he he's mentioned this before, he doesn't really have any particular attachment to his identity as Obito. Which is why he took on the name Toby, and also even claimed to be Madara. But, yeah, if I had to say why, it would be because you let Rin die. Dun-dun, that's the big revelation. So apparently, yeah, Rin did die. We'd already kind of gotten a fair confirmation of that back in the Invasion of Pain arc. But now we've figured out at least that Kakashi apparently had something to do with it, or, you know, he just failed to protect her in some sense. But then Kakashi's like, me, aren't you going to blame me for this? Aren't, why, why are you taking this out on the Leaf Village? He's like, no, that reality is insignificant. I'm not going to blame you. He's going to make a new world. And then Naruto is giving him some encouraging words. We have to stop him. And guys trying to encourage him too. So and then uh Toby, Obito, whatever, uses a katon, chaotic dance of the exploding winds, which I feel like we've seen before, but Naruto manages to stop some of the flames with his uh QB tails and then boom, big explosion if something comes out from under the ground. We see the Uchiha crest, which means it can only be one person, Madara, who says you seem to be having a lot of fun, Obito. Which makes me think, I mean, this is... I have to wonder if is going to fight Obito. I mean, that, that would mean that technically the fight between Madara and the Kages is either over, or he just said, eh, I don't care anymore, I'm going to leave. But, yeah. It's... I can only imagine that... Because, I mean, even the end of the chapter said something to the effect that this is like the final big uh, development, or the... Well, He's treating like this is the final arc, but I have a feeling this is still going to go on for a while, kind of like Bleach's final arc, because they haven't even gotten really, really close to it. Toriko 2... Uh, 2.02? Yeah, 2.02. People are getting hit by the green rain. You gotta take shelter. They're asking him, Toriko about the smell. He didn't say there's any really change in it, because he's not f afraid or tense or anything. Zebra says there's nothing different about it. its breathing or its blood pressure or its heart rate. Coco can't see any disturbances in electromagnetic night waves and can't see the shadow of death. And I don't know about Sonny. 
I'm guessing his touch is... He can't reach that far. He even says... He, Sonny says, yeah, that the four beast doesn't even see them as anything more than food. And the green rain's like a dressing. Anyway. Yeah, Tori goes asking if he's tasty. It's been so long since the four of us fought together, but Zebra's like, I don't need you. I'm more than enough. So he uses his... A new technique, I think, jet voice that sends him flying like a rocket, kind of. Coco says that he, uh, Zebra's been sending Otodama to tell everyone to get away and beware of the rain and all that. Zebra uses his meteor noise, which I think he used against the uh, mount, mount Turtle, and then his beat punch, which I think he definitely used against uh, the Mount Turtle to, to defeat him. But then Zebra gets smacked through these buildings, DBZ style. And then it turns out the uh, four beasts just made the vibrations that he used with the beat punch escape from outside his body. Or escape from the inside of his body. So, he, so he's able to control vibrations. Apparently. Kiss uh, scatters his feathers to seal off his field of vision. He uses the Dokuyumi, but apparently the four beasts now is able to... Uh, he can also he can like multiply his eyes. He has like eyes all over his body, apparently. He fires the poison arrows. They're broken by a tentacle, and then Coco as well is slapped by one of those the four beast arms tentacle things into a building. As his old and Kiss is beaten up as well. Sunny uh, captures him with Quinn as usual because Quinn is super long and can wrap around the legs. Uses a super hair shot. Boom! Punches him in the face. But then he sends a shockwave of it in t down his leg into Quinn. So again, he's able to control shockwaves. He's able to control sound waves that are pushed inside his body. Then he emits these uh, adhesive particles and the smoke. So his hair can't really do anything. And then he just smashes in between his arms. Which looks uncomfortably like a penis when you see it. It really could have been drawn a different way as he cl claps his hands together and, yeah, squishes Sonny. I mean, if I had to describe what he looks like, it's a Maj It's like Majin Buu when he turns evil, but he's very fat, so it's kind of like Fat Buu with an evil face of, like, say, Majin Buu. Or even Kid Buu. Yeah, as Toriko says, uh, this beast has figured out all their abilities. And Toriko uses his uh, nail punches, his leg knife, and uh, leg fork, which would be basically every one of his limbs. A cookie punch with one arm, a cookie punch with the other, leg knife with one leg, and leg fork with the other. And he still gets squished into the ground. But it looks like Toriko's attacks actually managed to potentially do some damage, but probably not enough. Rin uses the, uh, what was the marking? I forget, it's like a, a thing with the chameleon's tongue, I forget the name the level tongs or something like that. Turns out his level is 310, but then it goes up to 320, so this thing is still not even, you know, at full power, apparently. Meanwhile, we go to Komatsu at Gourmet Towers at the Zeno. And apparently Dharma Horse is just looking, so I have to wonder if Dharma Horse is going to have some significant uh, part in this battle, like as a distraction for the Four Beasts. Because Dharma Horse's level, we don't even know what it is. We, I think we had some idea of Quinn's and Kiss's, although those are... Yeah, Quinn's and Kiss's levels are eh, probably average at best. Anyway, Yuda says the You know, he didn't think things would happen like this, but and Komatsu asked him if he can make the dish, and he's like, yeah, I can make one, but for make it for 700 million people, several hundred million people in under an hour, he wouldn't even make it, and then Komatsu wants to help, but even you wouldn't be a one millimeter enough. And we need a few hands. So Setsuno and her assistant, which I, I forget, I think her name, it's like No No, I think actually might be her name. It's kind of a silly sounding name. The next issue the four heavenly kings fight to the death, and will the antidote make it in time? Tension is building. Oh, making good progress here. Let's get rid of these. I already have these on an external hard drive. I need to move the fairy tale one, but yeah, let's finish off with my still favorite series. Even though Weekly Manga Recap continues to bash it, I was actually fairly frustrated because they were saying that the whole revelation about Toby being Obito was a predictable twist, and they were like, "Oh, that's okay." But then when they we had the twist 
or a supposedly a predictable twist about Kenpachi getting his butt kicked by Ju Habak, and they're just pissed at that. Which, I didn't even realize this. It's a quick little thing before I get into the chapter itself. Turns out, uh, another translation said that Kenpachi is considered one of the uh, five special war powers by Ju Habak and the Vandenike. So, if I had to say anything, Kenpachi might have gotten his butt kicked now, but he's probably going to get stronger and actually... I mean, he already posed a three. He already kicked three of the Stern Reacher's butts, so he's clearly... Even if he gets beaten up by Juabok, that doesn't mean he's not going to have an awesome moment in the uh, actual final battle, because this is just a skirmish at best. Chapter 506... Uh, the Fire 2, I believe is what it is. This unknown member, which you still don't know his name, the one with the glasses who has those guns that shot Shinsui in the eye quite a few chapters back... Yeah, it's quite pleasing your morale has returned, but there's one thing you miscalculated. And then we shift to uh, Yamamoto and Juabog. It's been a thousand years. I came to choke out your last breath, but this is technically what happened at the last page of the last chapter. But then, yeah, this guy says, there's one thing you miscalculated. Your boss will fall before our boss. After all, you aren't the only ones to get fired up by your boss's battle. And then Nanana, Najakup, and Aznot, and a third Stern Reacher who we don't even have the name of, I think... Kubo could have spared one panel, or he could have spared some of the space in the panel with the one guy who has, like, the mohawk to reveal his name and rank, but it would have been a little tricky. I mean, if I were him, I might have shifted the panels with Osnod and Nanana Najakoop up. I mean, so you could still see their faces, but you didn't need to have as much space for uh, the speech bubble. You could have cut off a little more of the chest area so that you could move the speech bubbles up a little bit, or, you know... Re, uh, reorganize them and resituate them so that they still fit but then we'd actually be able to get the name of this guy because why I wanted that is because Yamamoto kicks all three of their asses just <laughs> boom but then Shinsui says it's true there was miscalculation boom meanwhile yeah way over there this big explosion of Yamamoto's fire Zanpakuto Ryujin Jaka exploding no doubt and all that and he says yeah old man Yama isn't uh, someone that the rules of common sense apply to Sorry about that. There was a little interruption, but it's we can quickly probably split these together or something to that effect. I'm not that familiar with Audacity, but anyway, yeah. As Shinsui was saying, yeah, old man Yama is not someone the rules of common sense apply to. As we see, he kicked all three of their butts. But even uh, Juhabak is yeah, you idiots. So what happens when you meddle in my battles? And yeah, a thousand years. That's a big thing. Again, yeah, I think Yamamoto's been living for like 2,000 plus. Ha! Yamamoto attacks him, blocks him with his arm, so it looks, it looks like he might have gotten burned. And Yamamoto, yeah, you haven't changed. Juabak. Which, the way he's talking to me, apparently even he, like Aizen, kind of just thinks of his subordinates as just tools. <laughs> and Juabak says, you've gotten, you've really gotten old. Which is fair, because I mean... Well, apparently a thousand years ago he still had black hair, so I'm guessing in a thousand years you start doing that, getting really old. But he does say that Yamamoto still apparently loses himself to anger, which is probably one of his bigger flaws. Then we see Juabak bring out a sword. Well, apparently it was supposed to be a sword. It looks like it was just a metal, but it's a sword. Just kind of western-styled sword. The hilt is really interesting looking. Yeah, you know, Yamamoto's like, you've finally done it. But and then Jobak says, it seems like you're waiting for me to draw it to begin with. And he says, why do you think I was? It's because I was going to crush everything about you. And the sword apparently disappears in the flames, and the flames disappeared. And yeah, Yamamoto finally, after 500 plus chapters, well, I mean, since we've, well, it's probably hadn't been 500 chapters since we've seen Yamamoto, but let's go with about 400 chapters since we've seen Yamamoto. Maybe four, maybe 350 or so since we've seen his uh, Shikai. Now we finally see his Bankai, Zanka no Tachi, the long sword of the enduring flame. The strongest of the flame types and the oldest Zanpakuto, apparently. That's what it usually, that's what it brags about. So it's nothing to sneeze at, but I imagine... Either his Bankai is going to be stolen, or Juabak is still going to be stronger. Either way. But apparently we're just under an hour, thankfully. 
Yeah, so next week will probably be, let's see, Fairy Tale 299. Yeah, Fairy Tale 300 is coming up, which I imagine will probably, I don't know if it'll be nearly as important as Mashima wanted it to be. Let's see, KJV 169, Assassin Classroom 10, Takamagawa 9, One Piece 681. Naruto 601, Bleach 507, Toriko 203. Don't think there was a Watamote, and if there was, I'll probably be able to cover it next week. Does we still have at least a few weeks until my wisdom teeth surgery, thankfully. Otherwise, I'd be having it tomorrow. But I still have to get a consultation because the x rays are weird or something. Anyway, so uh, that'll be all for Weekly Shonen Rundown this week. You can check my updates on Twitter. I've really kind of I do have a Facebook page I could plug. It's uh, Kyokasui. It's uh, K Y O U K A S U I G E T S U, and then in parentheses Mirror Flower, comma Water Moon. It's a somewhat long page name, but I didn't want to just be Kyokasui. It's, it would have been a little too obscure sounding. That's where I've been updating when. Like, there's a page on Facebook that actually manages to update when some of the major chapters are uh, released, so I'll do that. I also post a lot of decent, a lot of anime stuff there, and anime and manga theme sort of stuff. I mean, I was posting stuff about Dragon Ball censorship yesterday. Not sure what I'll do today. But yeah, also you can follow me on uh, Twitter at Muichimotsu, M U I C H I M O T S U. That's really where I update about uh, the new chapters, because, I mean, Facebook, I it's more of a networking thing. Twitter, it's, I guess, where I try to just have these brief uh, little posts. So either way, okay, uh, I guess till then, uh, keep reading, guys. This will be a weekly show and rundown, and hope to keep entertaining you.